Hello everybody and welcome to the Tuesday edition of Video Clips and just a couple of announcements. First of all, remember Wellness Forum Foods has gifts for the holidays and inside this tin, just to open it up for you here, we have gluten-free cookies. We also have tins like this with gingerbread biscotti and I'm starting to get thank you notes from all the people I've been sending gingerbread biscotti to. They love our cookies so all kinds of fabulous gifts called Wellness Forum Foods. And the other thing I want to make sure you guys knew about is Forks Over Knives The Extended Interviews is now out. 110 minute DVD with a lot of great stuff that ended up on the cutting room floor when the film is being made but is really interesting and very good information about diet and health and medicine. So you can get this online or you can call our office and order one of these for, of the, for some of your gift items too. And then one other announcement Time to register for winter semester 2013. I can't believe we're talking about 2013 already. We're offering chemistry, biology, women's health, microbiology, diet and autoimmune diseases, dietary supplements, food preparation, scope of practice issues, and abnormal psychology. So if you want more information on any of this stuff, give us a call. All right, two things I want to talk about today, and one is my favorite topic, exercise. Always the hardest thing to get people to do, one of the most important things to get them to do. Um, diabetics are, and I'm going to talk about diabetics and exercise here, but diabetics are particularly at high risk for developing cardiovascular disease because the same diet and lifestyle habits that lead to the diabetes also lead to coronary artery disease. And a recent study showed that diabetics who increase their physical activity can reduce their risk of both cardiovascular and all-cause mortality. Data from 15,000 people and the Swedish National Diabetes Register were gathered with participants grouped according to their physical activity. So one group included people who were labeled low physical activity, not moving around at all or maybe exercising one time a week. The others were labeled uh, regular exercise between three times a week and every day. Well, during a five-year period of time, the people who were exercising, of course, less likely to develop cardiovascular disease and die from it or die from any other cause than the people who were sedentary. But the interesting thing is about 20% of the people who began in the category of low exercise, um, managed or low physical activity, were able to increase their activity to three times a week during the study period. And for those, the number of cardiovascular drops, uh, deaths dropped 67% when compared to their sedentary counterparts. So, and the risk of dying of other causes also dropped by the same percentage. So the bottom line is exercise affects disease progression and the possibility of dying. Now, none of these people were eating the right diet. They weren't being counseled about the dietary excellence, which could have gotten rid of their diabetes. And the people that were in the regular exercise category weren't exercising as much as we might advise them to at the wellness forum. So you can only imagine how dramatic the effects would have been had these people been practicing dietary excellence and exercising five or six days a week, um, keeping in mind uh, intensity and, and um, progression and some of the things that we talk about here. But even a moderate change in the amount of activity that you experience every day is good for health. And if you want to experience optimal health, do the whole thing that we talk about here, of course. Now the next thing I'm going to talk about is, I just can hardly believe it actually. I guess I should be beyond getting surprised about things, but um, some things do, do still shock me. Uh, lately, the American Academy of Pediatrics issued a statement advising that red meat should be introduced to infants at six months of age in order to avoid anemia. And the idea was presented at a conference held in October of this year, and Frank Greer, MD, stated that, quote, red meat is the nutrient-rich food that biologically may be best as the first complementary feeding for infants. Now, I first heard about this whole thing at a meeting for the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine last weekend. So I decided to check this out for myself by going to the American Academy of Pediatrics website. And this statement was posted on the website. For a baby's first food, rice cereal is not as nutritious as other food options and only became popular in the past 30 to 35 years because it was thought to be the least allergenic of the cereals. Other options for a first weaning food include red meat, which in this little statement, Dr. Greer, the one I cited earlier, said, contains the iron and zinc that breastfeeding babies in particular are lacking after six months of breastfeeding. So in addition to this god-awful recommendation to eat red meat for infants, um, the inference is that breastfeeding is maybe an inferior form of feeding for babies, which is patently false. 
To add insult to injury, the AAP has developed a continuing medical education program so that doctors can earn credit while learning how to teach moms to feed their infants artery clogging animal protein and saturated fat at an even earlier age. Now, what would cause a group like this to adopt such a policy? This made me a little curious. And according to PCRM staff members who've been researching the issue, Dr. Greer has connections to the dairy industry. A quick internet search showed that in addition to his position, position as professor of pediatrics at the University of Wisconsin, he is secretary treasurer of the executive committee of the International Society for Research in Human Milk and Lactation and a representative of the AAP to the Three a Day of Dairy for Stronger Bones Advisory Panel. He's quoted as saying, quote, milk is one of the richest dietary sources of calcium and vitamin D, critical for building strong bones in kids and, te and teens and providing the best defense against developing osteoporosis later in life. While calcium supplements and non-dairy foods such as calcium fortified beverages are an alternative, these products do not offer milk's unique nutrient package. Well, my gosh, it'd be hard to duplicate milk's unique, unique uh, nutrient package, what with the cancer-causing protein in included at all. Now, my internet search did not identify exactly how Dr. Greer is being paid by the dairy industry and how he's compensated, but I did find a copy of the report to Congress on the National Dairy Promotion and Research Program for 2008 that lists Greer as a member of the National Fluid Milk Processor Promotion Board. He's listed on several dairy sites with quotes enthusiastically promoting the superiority of dairy consumption. Well, obviously, it's just an ongoing saga of the conflicts of interest that exist in medicine and health. It's despicable. Um, fortunately, PCRM plans to aggressively counter this ridiculous and harmful information, and we need pediatricians who are willing to come forward to uh, write and speak about this issue. So if you are a forward-thinking pediatrician who is as appalled by this situation as I am, please send me an email at pampopper at msn.com, and I'll tell you what you can do to help out out so that this doesn't become more prevalent than it already is. I mean, I'm just absolutely appalled. And of course, one of the biggest impediments to health improvement in the country is the difficulty in helping over 300 million people understand that the sources of information and health they've been told to trust are not trustworthy anymore. Um, there are exceptions, but unfortunately, they're few and far between. So that's all for today. I'll be back to you on Thursday. As usual, please pass this on to anyone who you think would benefit from watching it. Have a great day.